Well, first and foremost, thank you all for joining us today. This is uh, a really a good treat for us to be able to share uh, some of our perspectives on the user experience. And by our, I mean the National Democratic Institute and, and the representatives who've worked uh, with the organization in the past. Um, so the conversation today is really going to um, be focused on um, what the a new user's experience uh, is with CiviCRM. Um, and today we've assembled uh, a panel of, of really great speakers to, to speak on the subject. Um, first off, my name is Mayra Manuelent, and I am a senior program assistant at the National Democratic Institute. And I'm joined uh, today by Maggie Epps, who is a developer at AGH Strategies, who worked uh, really closely with NDI on our usability testing, which we'll discuss uh, later in the presentation. We also have David Kennan here, who is going to be talking about a specific program that we did in Belarus uh, that actually used City CRM, and he'll be talking about um, his experience in the field uh, training folks um, on the tool. And last but not least, we have Mahavash Ataki, who uh, was the former program manager at NDI with the technology team, um, and she did a lot of work on actually managing the project. Um, that uh, really focuses on projects that focus on city CRM, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, what that experience was like from, from her perspective as well. Um, so just to get us started though, before that uh, conversation begins, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the NDI, the National Democratic Institute, um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization here, um, based in our headquarters are here in DC, and our real focus is on international political development. And what that means is really strengthening the connection between governments and between citizens. Um, and we do that in a number of ways through citizen engagement programming um, that really focuses on um, increasing engagement in, in governance and public policy issues more, more broadly. Um, and then also working with governments to be more responsive and to be more accountable to their citizens. Um, and our main, pro our main partners in the fields are political institutions, and we work a lot with political parties, um, we work a lot with legislatures and civic organizations, and then NDI also works with uh, individuals, so that includes um, you know, human rights activists, bloggers, and uh, citizen journalists, so we have quite a range of partners, and our programming um, has to kind of adapt to meet their specific needs. Um, and so what we've found in recent years uh, for NDI and the technology team in particular, um, is that as we're using CIVI CRM uh, to support our programs in the fields, that there are uh, plenty of challenges that come, uh, you know, that have arisen um, through that process. And so those are the kinds of challenges that we're going to be talking about here. Um, but then what we want to do for the second portion of this discussion is to actually have a group exercise where um, we'll give you all a prompt and we'll, you know, lay out a scenario and have you all talk amongst yourself in these groups um, about the different challenges uh, that you can foresee not only our organization facing, but organizations uh, globally working with CIVI, CRM, or tools like it. Uh, face. And then also just kind of brainstorming potential um, solutions or ways to overcome the, the types of barriers or challenges that these groups would face. Uh, so that's just a general layout of, of our presentation today. Um, but without further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and get started with David. And he's going to be talking again from uh, the perspective of an implementer in the field, specifically looking at our Belarus program. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm David Kennan. Uh, yes, as Maron said, I was the main implementer of a CIVI CRM project in Belarus. Uh, it was a couple years ago, so I apologize if I forget some of the CIVI specific terminology, but I think I, through sitting through the sessions this morning, I think I remember all of it. I had some nice flashbacks to crazy troubleshooting moments, but um, the, the, it, the program was using two main tools. One was CIVI CRM, and the second one was, was TAILS, which I'm not going to talk about today, but it was, it's another open source um, tool that we shared with the partners, and it helped secure the project. But CIVI was the main functionality. TAILS was something we used to access. Yeah, and I'd be happy to talk about that with, offline with anybody who wants to, but for today's presentation, I'm going to talk about the CIVI side of the project. So who, who were we working with? In Belarus, our partners were mostly political parties. There was one, six, six political parties that were our partners. One of one partner was a civic group, but it was essentially a political party in waiting. They were a civic group who was hoping to turn into a party in future elections. And then there was one coalition of parties. 
Um, but so NDI works with political parties all over the world. We work with them on all sorts of things. Uh, the one, our partners really like the campaign management side of it. They want to know how to win elections. Uh, we also work with them on election protection. We work with them on uh, translating their policy platforms in a campaign into actual policy when they're elected. But for this project, we were mostly focused on field organizing. Uh, so just as a reminder to everybody here, I'm sure many of you have worked on political campaigns in the past, um, and it's not that different from civic organizing. But the main phase, I just want to start out with the main phases of a field campaign, which would be identification, persuasion, mobilization, sometimes called GOTV. And in the former Soviet Union, they kind of add a fourth phase, which is election protection. Right? Not only do you have to get your people identified, persuaded to vote for you, mobilized to actually vote, but you then also have to protect the vote, make sure that when they vote, the votes get counted correctly. This is not necessarily something we always worry about here in the States. Um, and the basic field activities, again, not that different from what civic groups might do, but phone banking, direct mail, canvassing, right? We're trying to contact our voters or our supporters and our potential supporters. So um, this might sound fairly intuitive to you guys, but uh, in the Belarus context, we kind of had to dumb it down to the most basic, uh, basic issues, right? So we were, our partners had, didn't have online uh, data systems whatsoever. Many of them were using paper-based files. Um, some of them, a few had uh, computer-based systems, but they were, it was like an access database. And so the problem was that they're very hard to share with other organizers. Uh, so Civi created a nice solution for that. Um, in, in Belarus, all of our partners had dealt with the issue of confiscation, right? Mm -hmm. Every single one of them had been, uh, their offices had been raided by the police, uh, and their files, either their paper files or their um, computer files were confiscated. We actually had worked with them. The very first version of this database project several years ago was an access database that was hosted outside of the country. And the parties would come outside of the country, access the database, print their lists, go back into the country, do their activity, come back, enter the data that resulted from the activity. So it's very you know, putting it online solved a lot of these solved a lot of these problems. Of course, it created other problems, um, security related problems. But we can talk about we can talk about that as well. Um, and then, of course, the, the the issue of having one master, right? If you're if you're, you know, organizing events based on a spreadsheet or paper files, like ch sharing them with sharing them with the rest of your organizers is challenging. So, Civi creates this one master solution. Okay, so we presented this to the partners as a tool for organizing their data online, but it basically had two two main functions. The first one. As, long, as soon as the data was imported, they were able to do right away. One was just to you to organize their members, their supporters, and their potential supporters. I mean, just with the data they already had, it was like a membership or supporter uh, engagement platform. But we were also quite aspirational that the database could turn into more of an organic voter file, and they could use it to target um, to target voters for voter contact. So in the organizing member side of this, um, it was used for keeping track of you know, party bodies, um, volunteer recruitment, event crowd building, um, identification of organizers, observers, things like that, managing newsletter, fundraising is something they didn't really use it for, but something they could use it for, um, and mobilization. Now, most of their lists, the data that they had was quite limited. Um, they all had membership lists of, kind of who was members of their party. They also had signature lists. In order to campaign or to get on the ballot in campaigns, they had to submit certain numbers of signatures. And one of NDI's main you know, goals with the parties was for them to re-engage these, these one-time supporters. They had used these signatures just to get through the exercise of registering and almost never re-engaged these people. So it was a great... Um, it was data that they had that they weren't inputting anywhere and they weren't using it in any meaningful way. So by putting it in a database and reinforcing these messages of, of uh, mobilization and persuasion that we were able to get them to use 
uh, the data more effectively. Uh, but then the, the second uh, goal of the database was for targeting, right? We wanted them to be able to collect different, or to enhance their data over time on the data that they had and collect more data so that they could target people more effectively. In the last session, they were calling it segmentation, but essentially the idea is, you know, certain people in your database you're going to engage in different ways than others. You've got, you know, if, if this person is a diehard supporter and you already know that, you might you recruit them for volunteers or fundraising, things like this. But someone who just signed your signature page one time several years ago is you know, someone you would engage in a different way. And they didn't have a way of kind of differentiating between you know, why this person was in their database or not. Um, so like I said, this is, was under this targeting activity, we, we, we had these sub-activities. So we were able to re-engage previously engaged voters, um, identify areas of strong support, right? We could use geographic searches to figure out where our supporters were located. Um, we could determine who are undetected, or who, who exists in our identification universe, right? Who are unidentified or, un, or supporters that are, uh, what do you call it? Like in, in the US, we would call it a three, right? You're a one if you're a supporter of the candidate, you're a two if you're a potential supporter, three would be undecided or in the middle, swing, four, leaning support for the other guys, five, diehard support for the other guys. So these are our threes. Um, similarly, you could kind of identify your persuasion universe, the people that are threes and twos. Um, with more data, they would be able to kind of do things like inform their messaging strategy, assuming they had, they found out that after they did all this data collection, they realized they had lots of ones or strong supporters who were women from the age of 40 to 60, you know, that might change their message a bit. Oh my gosh, like all, <laughs> all of our supporters are women's in their 40s and 50s. Maybe, maybe we should be talking about issues that they care about. Um, and of course, tracking voter contact progress over time. Um, so the idea was, right, we give them this tool, and <laughs> the more data they get, the better the tool can be, can be used. Um, the, the, we didn't do too many customizations to the database, um, because we, quite frankly, had spent a lot of time just getting it to, to, to work the way it was <laughs> we, we expected it to. Um, but the, some of the things we did, we made cust a custom field for political preferences. This is similar to like what I was saying in the, in the US, we have this one to five system, right? You wanna identify every contact um, as a strong supporter, a lean supporter, undecided, lean against, strong against. So we added a custom field for that so that we could, so it could help them with this, their identification, persuasion, mobilization. Um, we, for security reasons, we created some geographic access restrictions, right? We didn't want every, every user to be able to see the whole database. I think the, the partners were, very, were really nervous about people inside of their own parties who were not good actors, who, were taking, who would either sabotage the database or take the data and give it to others, namely the government. Um, so what we did is, one way to limit this was to make sure that people who are in Minsk could only access the Minsk city or Minsk county, Oblast, uh, um, data set similarly with other parts of the country. Uh, we disabled and removed some of the bells and whistles of CIVI. There were lots of things that they didn't want to do. They wanted, for security reasons and for capacity reasons, they didn't want to have any public facing uh, integration. So emails were out, web forms were out. So, we, and this also made it, the, the, by disabling some of this stuff, it made it move a little faster. We. Um, just admittedly spent a lot of time doing a, a customization on addresses uh, that was eventually aborted. Uh, this was uh, partly my fault, partly the partner's fault, but we essentially, the partners had told me that, that all of their addresses worked in a certain way, and so we created all these special fields for sub, sub, sub sections of addresses in Belarus, and then you know, I got more data from the partners, and sure enough, what they had told me was incorrect, and we had spent a lot of time 
um, creating customization that didn't make sense. And we actually went back to to what um, what set, you know core city does, which is just blank address field. Um, okay, so the, the title of this panel, that was the, the basics of the project, and I can answer questions on other aspects of it, but the title of our panel is It's Complicated, New User Experience. So what, what sort of challenges did we face, or what, where did we have issues? Um, we, had, we had some very limited computer skills of some of our partners. Others were great, um, but uh, there's one party called Just World, which is the re kind of reform communist party. They're the members of their youth wing, who were 45 years old, <laughs> were, were the, the people who were participating in our training. Um, so they had some of them, I mean, were typing with one finger and things like that. Uh, we had a, a reasonable fear of surveillance, both, both human, like I was talking about, moles or people that would, that would be stealing or sabotaging their information, and, and uh, also like computer surveillance. Like people were very nervous about putting their data online, at least when it was a paper system or a localized database. They had some faith that it was protected by putting, putting it online. They were quite nervous about it. Um, we also just, we had some issues with Sibri itself. The translations were not perfect, and we were able to enhance them over time. Um, the document On the documentation side, there was almost no I mean, I don't remember exactly, but there wasn't much documentation in Russian language, or and definitely not in Belarusian. Um, we we found a decent amount of bugs, even in some of the basic functions. Some of that came from using a sec, uh, using non-English characters. I think when we when we the more <laughs> the more Russian characters, Cyrillic characters we had in there, the the trickier it got. Um, the, but, but truthfully, the basic functions of Civi were quite easy to train, right? When we were creating a, a call list, I guess it was just an export to Excel. Um, not that hard to do. Creating mailing labels, not that challenging to do. Basic searching functionality was quite simple. Using the batch update to, to uh, record the data from your, from your activity was not that challenging. But when we got into more administrative functions, importing of data, um, creating user, creating users and roles and responsibilities was was very tricky. I remember we had a seven page, I had to create like a seven page cheat sheet on importing data. So like every bit of, every field had a different uh, thing they had to do to make sure it, it uh, went into the database and wasn't kicked out. Um, obviously, in a in a place like Belarus, we have bandwidth and speed issues, um, internet connectivity issues. But we also, the security side of this project made that much slower. We accessed the database using this Tails um, tool, which uses Tor. And if you've ever used Tor, you know that it goes, it bounces your internet connection through three pro three proxies before it gets to Civi, and then it bounces them through those proxies on the way back. And we just made we made a slow tool even slower. <laughs> so and some people complained that it was you know almost uh, unusable. Did you do that just for security reasons? Yeah, it was it was mostly for security reasons, and I'm i not I think they some of them just skipped that step to use their tool now. <coughs> but at, I think at the beginning of the project, it was it was important for them to feel that putting their data online was going to be safe. And um, so in the, in the so we talked about the challenges, but now let's talk about successes. We we really did create a lot of you know knowledge building, and skills building in several areas in the digital because we talked about uh, how to put your data online and access it securely. We learned a lot about digital security through the through the through the project, um, and that using data for political organizing was a great way to reinforce all sorts of things that we were working with them on campaigns anyways. Uh, the, um, there, something that I've seen in all corners of the former Soviet Union, there's a lot of untargeted campaign activity going on. They, they love to set up a tent outside of a metro station, pass out newspapers to everybody who gets off, 
sure they're collecting data and getting um, email addresses, but they're essentially targeting, they're, you know, they're giving their <laughs> materials to anybody. Um, when when in the, in, here in the U.S., the political campaign would try to get your materials in the hands of the right people. Um, uh, the data hygiene, or the training parts of the training was really excellent. You know, people learning how to manipulate data in Excel. Uh, we we discovered some really neat things with the Russian language and how you can, like, you know, if someone's a, if you don't have gender data, you can figure it out based on kind of the middle names in the Russian language tell you tell you uh, the gender. Um, the, we also realized that they were collecting data. They, they were only collecting the data they needed to um, to get the signatures submitted, right? So they were getting names, gender, a birthday uh, address, but they didn't. They weren't collecting phone numbers. You know, just just by introducing this system and realize, realizing that they need to re-engage their voters in some way help them realize that, gosh, we're going through all this effort to get this data from people so we can get on the ballot, but we're not, <laughs> we're not using the data for anything else, or we're not asking the right questions. So I think they just, they took the, the sheet that they were using to collect, and they added, you know, five more columns to it, and they got a lot better data that way. And I'm not sure they would have if we hadn't kind of done this, done this intervention. Um, the, at the end of the project, six of our partners were left standing, and <laughs> they all adopted this as their, as their party's um, a main database, or contact management database, and, and the people who were in the training became the, the main administrators of that database. Um, and one of the nice things, it hasn't, I don't know if it's happened since we left, but by, give, by creating these eight databases, that we're all using the same system and the same um, customizations. Obviously, people can, the partners were able to customize themselves, the, the databases themselves using tags and groups and, and whatnot, but by having all the same custom fields this, the, and the basic customization, they, there's kind of this potential for joint work in future. In previous elections in, in Belarus, they have kind of gotten behind a unified candidate and if, because they're all using the same system, they're able to integrate their data at some point, some future date. Uh, okay, should I open for questions or should I move on to? So perhaps we'll take questions at the very end, if that's all right. We'll just move on to our next uh, our next speaker, and that'll actually be Mah Mahvash. So feel free to hand the mic to her. Um, and just a refresher, so uh, David just touched on a lot of the um, kind of challenges and the successes really that he uh, faced when in the field, um, in Belarus specifically, and, and Mahvash was working on a lot of civi uh, programming from DC, and so she'll touch base uh, and, and really elaborate on what her experience um, was um, doing the recruiting of developers, um, working on uh, the testing and the prototyping, the outreach work that actually is involved in, in being able to um, to execute something like this in the field with our partners. So I'll uh, go ahead and hand it off to Mahvash. Thank you, Maron. Hi, everyone. Um, so my typical role um, at NDI was actually doing technical project management. So living um, in the constraints of the uh, of software development like life cycle, gathering requirements, managing timelines, managing budgets, managing resources, and basically getting the product off the ground, getting the product to take off. So that was my role in, as part of this. David just spoke to you about a typical use case um, that is an audience for um, a tool like this, which is for political organizing um, and for campaign management. Uh, they tend to be, the political parties who tend to use this tool um, we brand them as our partners, NDI partners in the field. Um, but we also have staff in the DC office who are interested in using CIVI for the same, same needs, contact, managing, contact management, as well as in field offices. But a lot of our field offices use um, uh, CIVI for contact management as well. So I'm sorry I don't have a sexy presentation like David, but <laughs> hopefully I can keep this as a conversation and, and you know, we can talk about um, you know, different aspects of, of my role as um, working with city. 
Um, essentially, um, when it comes to technical project management, obviously I was also in charge of managing a lot, a lot of the risks. Uh, so making sure that um, the budget remains the way it, it, it shouldn't be touched because there's really no money when it comes to um, you know, adding new requirements or um, shifting the timeline and adding more resources. Um, but particularly, I do want to mention a couple of things during the different stages of our software development life, life cycle, which I hope are of interest to, to this group. And I also want to learn from you all um, as part of our uh, brainstorming session that we have planned at the end of the day in these particular areas. So one of the trends that I used to notice as part of um, project management was, of course, um, adoption. You know, first, uh, selling them the, the idea. Why is this a good idea? Why use Civi? That used to be our first step, is, you know, people um, all around the world have a different way of doing things, and sometimes they don't see uh, the benefit of incorporating technology um, in their workflow. They are fine with paper, and they're fine with the Excel spreadsheets. So the first step is to sell them the idea to use technology and to use an open source tool like Civi. Once you've done that, it comes to really understanding how they could use it and how they could apply it to their particular use case. So that's the whole stage of gathering requirements, understanding the need, figuring out how can, how can this tool really help them and automate the process. And out there, I would say that um, uh, what has worked in the past is, has been moving away from um, you know, the, the waterfall style of project management, which is gather the requirements, go away for three months, go build it, and then come back and say, ta-da, here's your tool, use it. And then they're like, oh, wait, we didn't think we wanted this button here. Or why does it say, um, how do we change this tab? And for anyone who's worked in software development, you'll know that things seem minor to the end user, but require a lot of, can require a lot of programming and going back to the drawing board, it, especially when it comes to you know, changing the workflow of the product or even uh, like modifying the entire architecture of the tool itself. So one thing I would even you know, suggest is um, think about doing things in an iterative fashion. You know, iterative development is the way to go. Um, you could explain to, uh, to your end users, you know, partner with them, build the trust in the beginning, in the beginning of the project, and make suggestions like, um, okay, so you want this database in three weeks. Um, we're gonna give you something to look at, let's say, in a week. Um, at that point, you get to decide if you want to change things, or would you like to continue adding your features? So what I used to do is, you know, I'm sure a lot of project managers in, in this room are familiar with is basically create a product backlog. So at the beginning, they've said, we want the product to be able to, we want this tool to be able to do X number of um, things, you know, manage people, send out newsletters, integrate with MailChimp, um, you know, have um, an event management section <coughs> in, in there. So you, while you have gathered the, the high level requirements in the beginning, you introduce the tool to them somewhere in the middle of, of, the, um, of the development process so they can touch and feel things and at that point um, it's a check-in point for you as well. Are you going in the right direction or um, should you stop and reevaluate and go back to, to the drawing board? Um, the third thing I would say is that anticipate their needs in the sense of um, uh, managing a successful project is not just delivering a piece of software. Managing a successful project also means making sure that there's sustainability um, roped in, you know. Um, so it's, uh, it comes as a package. So you need to make sure that they have talent on their team who is going to be managing this database. Um, after you have developed it for them. And when I say managing, you know, from a user administration standpoint, because most of the time you're talking, the people you're talking to who are helping you design this tool tend to be the consumers of the, of the tool and they want to, you know, 
query the tool and filter it and use it. But they also need someone in the back end who's creating users, who's managing the hosting, who's also making sure the server is up and running. And that is one thing that we used to notice that most of our partners in the field, or even our field staff, there is a capacity lacking there. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and um, yeah, so um, those are a couple of things. The, the other thing was um, just helping them understand the relationship between open source and um, customizations. Because when sometimes I think we rush into um, sell the idea of open source, and I'm a huge advocate for open source. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to say. But open source comes with a heavy lift as well. So somehow, we, if we can make it easy for these local NGOs all around the world to also build the capacity um, in order to be able to customize Civi, because that talent tends to um, basically does not exist um, all around the world. Um, we've been fortunate, you know, we're sitting in a room with a lot of city talent over here. Um, we have these great community meetups as well as these annual conferences. But um, I think it's our responsibility when we are introducing technology to, um, and you know, in the, in the field, in, out um, in developing countries, to also um, improve the capacity when it comes to actually. Um, managing the software as well as customizing the software. Um, on the sustainability point, I would love to hear from you all on um, a more one-click kind of model when it comes to hosting. Um, also, a push-button model when it comes to updating the software itself. So, I hope we can get answers to a couple of the, of uh, those challenges, and as well as uh, you know, moving. Moving, uh, the world is moving to a SaaS model. So, um, really thinking about what is the next step for Civi? Like, you know, we are living in a world these days where a kid in Africa could have a smartphone and download an app and start using it. I mean, with Internet.org launching in Zambia, we're gonna have, we're gonna start living in a world where usability is a given. So, I think we need to be as a community who's committed to Civi and invested in Civi, um, think about designing tools for that kid in Africa and seeing you know, what, what could we be doing better um, when it comes to adoption and when it comes to usability. Um, Meron, did you want to talk about something else? No, that's perfect, actually. And that's actually a perfect segue to Maggie, who's going to be talking about the work that we did at NDI to really enhance the user experience. And so um, with Mahavash's uh, um, support on this, uh, on this particular initiative as well, and Maggie here too, uh, what we did was we launched a series of usability tests at NDI. Um, we looped in some staff who had varying degrees of experience with political organizing and not really at all with CIVI, um, or to varying degrees uh, using CIVI, a CRM as well. Um, and what we did was we did a, a simulated kind of a, a test, and we wanted to see how their experience uh, was using the tool, and Maggie was able to really sit in on that, and, and speaking from a developer's perspective, she'll be able to share kind of uh, what she observed in that session, and uh, some of the lessons learned that came out of that as well, um, and then how we then adapted uh, kind of the things that we learned from that session into improving the tool for NDICs. So go ahead, Maggie. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to everybody else. Uh, those were great presentations so far. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting how like I feel like this comes like it's it's been a great progression. Uh, <laughs> sort of led to where I came in, which was interesting for me because um, I met with NDI you know once, <laughs> and then we said we're going to go do this usability testing. And I walked in this room. Um, I had sort of I had put up a site for everyone, and I had installed a couple extensions, and then they were like, let's go. And I remember I walked in, and Mabash said, okay guys, we're going to test this product. Maggie helped build it, so if you have problems, <laughs> yell at her. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, it was great. That's I was not how I saying. typically do things, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you phrased it a little <laughs> more gently. But I had cookies. <laughs> you did have cookies, which helped a lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so, um, and there was, 
the way that the testing worked was really interesting to me. There was a list of questions, and you know, it's funny, I, I looked at the questions, and I, I started reading them, and I immediately wanted to rewrite them. And I wanted to rewrite them in a way that made sense with Sui, because I wanted to rewrite them in the way that I would talk to a client about them. Um, so for example, the very first question, it was, um, find, what was it, find a party. Mm -hmm. It was like, find you know, this party. And I said, well, no, you want to find an organization. <laughs> Um, because to me, that's what that's what that would be. Um, but in watching, you know, the first person I watched do this testing, I realized, well, they're using this tool for parties. And how is that person in the field gonna understand a party? And you know, she was looking around. She was looking for tags. She was looking for, you know, and she didn't even like actually think that hard about is this an organization. She didn't necessarily look there right away. Um, so it's sort of these wording things where, to me, every day, because I'm in the code and because I'm using the software, you know, and just sort of like answering questions, I assume that everybody knows what words I'm using and, you know, what they are. And, and I would say, like, if somebody calls me and I would say, oh, go to the search box. And I assume they know what I mean. Whereas I wasn't allowed to prompt the user at all. And I sort of watched her want to find something and click a lot of places before figuring out where to go. Um, you know, she, the first user I watched never figured out that there, the search box in the corner could be used to look for a contact. Um, whereas to me, you know, I just never think about that and people call me and I just say, oh, go, go to the search box. Um, so I found that really interesting and um, I think the language thing was also the other thing where um, I think often with Civi, when we develop it, we really think people know the words we're using. Um, a good example of this is I was watching Andrew present earlier, and he did a great job talking about scheduled reminders. Um, but I was I was watching that, and I was thinking about this talk, and I was noticing that um, the way scheduled reminders work is you put in the title, and then you choose an entity to attach it to. And you know, to me, I'm like, sure, an entity. Yeah, you just choose the entity. But like, if I were a volunteer in Belarus, you know, who had been told send out an email to everybody who's coming to this event three days before, and I didn't know how to do that, I might not immediately go to Entity and be like, this is where I pick a vent. I might be clicking around that screen for a while before I figured that out. Um, so I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and you know, I think, though, at the same time, the challenge is how do we solve these problems, right? Like, Entity is a great word because it describes everything in that box. What's a better word? Um, what's a word everybody's going to understand? And I don't necessarily have the answer to that question. Um, and I think kind of going back to like me coming from a developer perspective, we went through this usability testing, and I could, I could definitely see the places where people are frustrated. Another place was they had to compile a list by date, um, by birthday. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was by age. By age. And so, but the only way they could do that was going through birth date. Um, and they went to the birth date search box, and they went into birth date, and it said it had like all these options, and the first one was within the last two weeks. And like it took the person I was watching a while to find, even find choose date range because they were looking at within one year and they're like, well, why would I want the person who was born within one year um, <laughs> to be voting? No, we yeah. don't want one year yeah. to be voting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, maybe if you're running a nursery school. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, then again, from the back end of Civi, the reason that's done that way is that there's a lot of other places where you're picking a date and you do want those options. And you know, from a code perspective, like that's a lot easier to plug in that date picker widget than it is to really, you know, write out to kind of custom code that for birth dates. So it's it's an interesting trade off, um, and I think that it goes back to a lot of things we've been talking about at this conference, which is as developers, you know, we often are limited by resources. We're often limited by what the user asks for, and sort of trying to translate that into, well, I want this amazing feature, but I you have two hours go. Um, and you know, I think, and then there's also the issue of like, I do this all the time where I build something and I just write a word in there that to me makes perfect sense. Um, like I'm like, yeah, everybody knows what a field is. Um, like another good example is, um, I think I'm gonna call Andrew out again, but um, um, but I saw that on his he uh, on the scheduled reminders when you choose a date that relates to a contact and you decide what date it goes like. How many hours before, what, this is the scheduled reminders, it says hours before date field. And, you know, of course to me, I'm like, oh, of course date field. But I was reading that, I was like, again, thinking about, as a user, like, would I think about what that means? Or would I just want to know, like, it's hours before date, and I get, might get confused. Um, 
so yeah, I think these are all trade-offs, and I'm not sure, um, I don't think there's like easy answers to these things. I just think it's a really interesting thing to be thinking about, because we get so used to the idea that people will have time to be trained, and we'll have the resources to train new people, and that somebody will just call us, I mean, I know, for, I do that at least, like somebody will just call me and ask me a question, and then I'll tell them, and everything will be fine. Um, but I think kind of thinking about that over the long run is sort of, um, I have this great note to myself, which is really clear, it's simplicity versus options, which is that I think the other issue is, you know, with Civi, we're always trying to build new <coughs> options for people, and that's a really, really good thing. Um, because I know that, it, like, for me and my job, my goal is that you don't have to call me. Um, and, like, especially if you're playing with the database, where, like, you don't have to call me to, like, fix something in the database, and so we create more and more options for people, but that only creates more and more fields for them to get lost in. Um, and so that's another trade-off I think we want to think about. And that's a really great uh, place to end our panel conversation here, um, is, is really to acknowledge that there are a range of political and development challenges that one would face when actually trying to implement CIVI um, in an international context, which is what we do at NDI. Um, and I, as Maggie mentioned too, there are a lot of limitations that tools have, and it doesn't, you know, just because you have a tool, it doesn't actually eliminate the need to really develop a good strategy, to really develop a good uh, implementation plan, um, like Manavash talked about earlier, uh, to actually ensure that these tools have uh, a good chance of, of actually being used in a sustainable way to achieve a certain end goal. Um, and so what we want to do now is, is um, perhaps we will open up to questions um, now, we'll just do a brief, you know, uh, question and answer session, and we want to jump actually right into uh, an exercise with you all just to get the conversation um, you know, moving forward a little bit uh, more. So perhaps let's start with the question and answer session, and I'll, I'll cut us off at a certain point, and then we'll go right into the exercise. Hi, I'm Mike Russell. I was uh, an original member of a thing called Crisis Commons, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really excited by each of the uh, each of the individual contributors here. And, Say one, one thing I thought has been very interesting throughout all the presentations we've heard here is that um, all of the use cases we've seen, at least as I've understood them, were dealing with Civi in very much kind of a back office, uh, not publicly facing, no social integration kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your particular case, David, I was wondering if you were familiar with some of these tools that might be a perfect front end complement, such as if you're familiar with Ushahidi, which is a tool that came out of the mm -hmm. disputed Kenyan elections in 2007. And the whole, uh, these, these are also free and open source tools, but in, in the case of Ushahidi, and then there's a kind of a disaster a response version of that from another company called the Sahana Foundation. Uh, but all these tools are incredibly cool because they marry, or they, in my mind, they would seem to be a perfect complement to Civi's function because they marry all of that great back office functionality to this idea of crowdsourcing public accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a crib sheet here because I had some notes about uh, Ushahidi. So, so that's a Swahili word that means witness. And uh, the whole idea was that it was a way to actually crowdsource social activism. So in other words, if somebody said soldiers are beating voters at this particular location, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, folks could document that, they could use social media to draw attention to it, they could bring in an NGO observer, you know, who would intervene and hopefully the bad guys would disperse. I, I just wondered if any of you might have some specific experience or use cases you could share on some of these other tools that, you know, I, I, I just happened to know about these things because I was in the right place at the right time, basically, but others others might not be familiar with them and might, might benefit from your insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, the ICT team, which Jared and Maron and Mavash used to work on, uh, yes, works has all sorts of ICT tools that they use all over the world, some of which are Ushahidi itself, some of which are uh, Drupal others Drupal-based. <laughs> but in, yeah, in Belarus, we had something that we called U YouTube Town Halls, which is now called... What? The issues, which is an NDI tool that we were using other places, but yeah, in in Ukraine, one of our partners was using a Ushahidi-based election irregularity tracking tool, which lets the public uh, report. And uh, yeah, we we use all sorts of different tools. I don't know if we've ever integrated it with a Civi installation or not, but it's certainly something that we could do. I mean, we uh, to be honest, in Belarus, like we were having a hard time getting 
just you know basic functionality uh, to go and not not all of it was you know bugs on the city side a lot of it was just this how we had slowed it down so much um, just the, the process to get a uh, mailing label out the printer you know was so many steps just logging in or <laughs> using tails logging in with a password installing your certificate so the handshake works with the website then going through the search saving the group one of the things we had to do was every time we did a uh, any sort of uh, voter engagement activity we had to save it as a group um, because so that you could use the batch update on the back end right if you wanted to record your results from your interaction with that group you had to make sure it was already saved in, saved in there so you could get that those same set of contacts back and that wasn't really intuitive when people started using it but anyway it was a, it was a, by the time I left the project we were still kind of grappling with these first these basic functionality issues and we had we had dreams of integrating SMS blast and things like that that was something that the the partner the partners really wanted to do and you know whereas they weren't comfortable with email or web forms they were comfortable with phone based communications but you know we we by the time the project ended we weren't there yet so I got to ask you a question I heard about the famous ice cream flash mobs in Minsk were you behind that or no. was that <laughs> I certainly wasn't, but <laughs> Jared probably was. He's the puppet master. Uh, he probably was. You just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to add to, to your question. Um, I do think that that's where we should be. We should be in a place where tools are integrated so that a person who's crowdsourced information, um, you know, that there was violence reported in my neighborhood, um, we have retained that information and we've just not used it to broadcast it for a, spe for a specific time period. But that information somehow gets attached to a, a bigger database, which, is, which could perhaps be city, uh, where we suddenly have a voter file created, a re record created for this one person living in a certain neighborhood, interested in certain issues, and yes, in this case, this person reported violence. But in another case, it could be um, someone who is, who is, you know, sharing information um, about health clinics, or perhaps um, something more related to another civic issue, education-wise, or um, you know, infrastructure-wise. And then suddenly, we have a profile of a person. Um, uh, in in city, so that we, when it comes to campaigning or when it comes to uh, reaching out to the community, we kind of get a pulse of the community and are able to understand what are the different issues this particular community tends to focus on or tends to report on. What happens usually in crowdsourced pr projects is they tend to be they tend to only meet meet a specific need. So you're crowdsourcing to get something. And then you, you, and then that's it. So your entire database and your entire visuals are just associated to answering that one question and not, not using that information beyond that particular need. Um, from, from a technology perspective, I, um, I can, um, I mean, the kind of tools we tend to use at NDI tend to be Drupal. We have used Ushady, but we tend to use a lot of Drupal. Uh, we do a lot of crowdsourcing via SMS during elections, as well as um, using another tool called Telerivit, which talks directly to um, Android, um, you know, OS. Um, so yeah, uh, those are the kind of tools that we've used. The, the, the particular tool that David mentioned is called Issues. It's under the band of Dem tools, and if you um, you know go to our the the ICT teams, I still say R because. You know, Still part of the family. Um, uh, if you go to the ICT Teams blog, team blog, which is um, demworks.org, you can learn a little bit more about the different tools that we've created, which are open source and are open to the community. 